So today we are doing part two, which is now going to be on the uh, uh, still participatory research. Sorry, I've put action, but it's meant to be participatory research. Uh, part two, and largely will focus on the data collection methods, uh, the kind of methodology that we need to have, what we need to put in place before we can proceed uh, with the actual process of the research. First, the most important thing as we start uh, going to the field, and we saw that in the, in the four stages that I presented last week, we need to put together a, a research team. <clears throat> it doesn't need necessarily to have all these detailed positions, as long as uh, we have at least a functional team, and we may pick some ideas here on what's helpful and what is not. Uh, one principal investigator, this is a person who supervises all the research activity and decides on how the resources are to be used. And this person uh, is, is really critical in terms of uh, also ensuring that the project meets specific deadlines, the funds are being properly used and proper channels are being done. If we need to hire somebody, all the procedures are done according to the institution, HR policies, or even the research institution. Then you have the research director, <clears throat> oversees all the research activities. How, um, how are we planning? Uh, when will we go to this particular place? Who are the people we need to contact? Um, have we done all the contracts with the people on the ground? Then the project director now is much more hands-on, uh, responsible for the day-to-day. -day. Somebody is sick, uh, there's a researcher who's not able to reach so-and-so, uh, we need a letter. Uh, the project director now does the day to day, arranging for the focus group discussions and all that. Then we have the research team coordinator uh, who will organize the team meetings and logistics, uh, small stipends and payments and transport and logistical arrangements. Uh, this is what the team coordinator does. So really hands-on administration uh, on the ground. Then uh, research assistants, uh, these ones collect data and support the research team as much as possible. Remember, this is participatory research. So uh, the persons who are on the ground are also helping out with uh, research themselves. They're co-researchers, not just uh, research assistants, but co-researchers. Then it's always good to have a data analyst, somebody who will help put that data together and uh, help with the analysis uh, especially if there's a lot of statistical data that has to be mined, uh, this is the kind of person you need. So that's your team. And you can skim it down. You can have assistant of assistant of assistant or just keep it as it is. Let's look at how we prepare the research team. One, um, uh, communicating the expectations. This is very important. Sometimes people join the research team and they have a very high expectation. Uh, one, maybe in terms of what is required. Um, um, I need to know how long will this take me? What is the time frame? Uh, how about my own commitment? Uh, how about remuneration? How about security, logistic? All those need to be properly communicated. Patience and consistency. Uh, PR or participatory research is not just like any other research. In most cases, uh, um, it doesn't really respect the time frame. Things tend to drag a little bit longer as we shall discuss later on. So people really need to be patient when it comes to uh, participatory research. And also the fact that you have to deal with the community and engage with them uh, in a much more uh, friendlier way as, as full participants to the research, as co-researchers. Fluctuating participation, uh, that's another thing that when we start research, we realize uh, the people you start with, and because PR takes much longer, six months, one year, it, it, you may end up losing people along the way. Uh, so uh, PR research tend to have a, a lot of dropouts because you need consistency with the community and also sometimes just because people need to fend for their lives and they're looking for uh, better payment opportunities. And, and if you're dealing with vulnerable communities uh, like this particular project of protecting uh, civilians or unprotected, unarmed civilian protection, 
we are dealing with already with a vulnerable population that does not have the daily means of uh, taking care of themselves. Personal reflexivity, this is key, um, sort of, and, and we'll talk about it in the next few slides, how to reflect on your own personal assumptions, on the diverse issues, some biases we may have, our own position and how that influences the research, our anxiety to meet the donors' uh, deadlines, and just our own personal experience. Epistemological reflexivity, uh, meaning that the way we look at reality that is not necessarily reflected on the ground. The interpretation we have for certain words and meanings do not necessarily reflect what's on the ground. So we really have to make sure that our level of analysis um, goes through the rigor of accuracy <clears throat> based on the methods that we are using uh, so that we are not so much framed uh, in our own uh, worldview. Uh, and especially if, and even if you're talking about those unarmed uh, civilian protection strategies, it may not be the same as uh, what the local people consider to be um, safe spaces. So safe space can be defined very, very differently uh, depending on which angle uh, and where you're coming from uh, in that particular environment. So if you're in South Sudan, you'll see so many people are carrying arms around. I remember one time I was in Somalia and um, uh, I was staying at Save the Children's uh, compound. And this, this, this was in the mid nineties. So the situation was still really volatile. And, and they told me the more arms you have around, the safer you feel. Uh, because it means if you attack from one clan, before we can bury, because Muslim communities will bury the very same day, before we can bury one, we'll have to make sure that somebody else you know, is being buried in the other clan. Um, and so that ensured the onset. But that's in, in anybody else's worldview is not uh, security. So these perceptions need to be uh, reviewed. At the same time, we talked a bit last week on recruiting participants. Now for data collection, we need to make sure we are uh, recruiting people of certain levels of knowledge. In situations of vulnerability, like in complex situations, as this research uh, seemed to focus, Unfortunately, we don't always have qualified people to work, even when we call them co-researchers. Uh, they're not as qualified. They don't know, some don't know how to read and write. Some may be very, very knowledgeable, but you need somebody to interpret what they are, uh, they are writing and doing. So we need to be creative there. Uh, a community leader, somebody who's very influential, you need him in the research team, uh, but you need to water down your language so that uh, the person is with you on the same page and somebody else can, can take notes as he speaks or as he questions uh, members of the community. Uh, you need to also brief them what the research entails uh, in order to get their full consent. In most cases, because you're dealing with vulnerable populations, they will be expecting uh, remuneration, for example. Uh, they'll be expecting change that you're going to bring. If you're looking at uh, how to prevent uh, domestic violence or uh, issues around poverty and vulnerability or income generating activities, they'll expect that maybe you have a plan to actually implement that. And that should be part of the uh, PR, uh, that at least there is some consideration for resolution or resolving the problem. Obtaining commitment of team members, uh, sign a contract with them, um, or uh, clearly show, uh, have a very clear show of commitment uh, at, from the beginning to the end of the research. So that things don't uh, remain a little flu and then you may be accused of um, uh, taking advantage of vulnerable population. Roles and relationships, very important, both between the researchers among themselves and also the participants. The roles and responsibilities have to be very clear, but we know that the participants are also co-creators or co-researchers. So we need to work with them very closely, uh, but at the same time have very clear role and clear chain of command. Training and supervision, uh, this has to be a, a professional training because you don't give somebody a tape record and say, these are the five questions you're going to ask. Uh, you need to take them through basic research methods uh, in terms of interviewing and sensitivities around the kind of questions that are being asked as well. Uh, so that, uh, if, for example, you may provoke uh, a trauma. You're going to ask somebody, uh, what has been your experience of war and conflict? How many children have you lost? Um, were you ever attacked? You know, this is somebody who lost two children and a wife. Uh, and, and you may provoke 
evoke a kind of a trauma that you're not able to, uh, to take care of. So managing expectation and ethics. Strategies of data collection. Um, explain how the research will be conducted in line with research goals. Um, how will we go about it? If you're going to have focus group discussion, how will we select uh, members of sec uh, focus group discussion? How are we going to, to map out the site uh, for research? We begin with the North, South, Central, and who are we going to target in the South and who are we going to target in the North? Uh, who will be the key people, the gatekeepers for us? If we want to access the South, who are the gatekeepers? What organizations are we going to partner with so as we go into the ground? So for data collection, that's very important. And it's important for your researchers to feel safe where they're going to work. Um, management uh, support strategies. The briefing is key. Every evening when people come back at, uh, home uh, from the field, an informal session of debriefing is very important. You may be able to pick certain things there. You may be able to, to, to check whether your questions are resonating with the original goal of the research or some of the reactions people are having or secondary trauma. I listened to somebody today who went through terrible horrors of, of, of war and conflict and that has affected me. I don't think I want to continue with this research. Now you need to listen to this person. Maybe you have one, you have two, you have three. Now, how do you come up with support strategies? This person may need counseling later on. Have you lined up that possibility? Uh, is it there in your, in your budget to take care of a situation where a researcher uh, goes through a secondary trauma or a researched person like we heard last week from Rehema, um, uh, the, the lady who had been trafficked a number of times and could not continue with the interview. What mechanisms do you have uh, as a support strategy on the ground? It's important that everybody in the research has a, 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 a clear logic model in terms of one, what is the purpose of this study? What questions emerge from this purpose that need to be addressed? We all need to be very clear for that. So we have a clear logical intention from the beginning to the end of the project. We also need to know who has previously studied these topics. Uh, that comes in the literature review. Uh, it comes in the assessment of the goals uh, and the things that we want to do uh, so that we are not duplicating what already exists or at least we are filling in some gap. What elements, variables, uh, were shown to be important in their studies, uh, if you're looking at the literature, so that you have your, your own variables or elements you want to treat are answering to certain needs. So how would I measure those same elements? Would I look at it differently? If they're looking at, uh, let's say, uh, survival mechanisms of um, women who had undergone war and trauma, and maybe the variables that you are measuring were only restoration of household, or they're also looking perhaps at the uh, level of perceptions of security. Uh, they're also looking at uh, uh, women who are able to get married. And so are you going to use the same variables? Or are you going to variate uh, your variables so that you have a different variety? What form of analysis would I need to implement? What form of analysis? Uh, is, is it going to be largely quantitative or will I have thick descriptions on uh, people's narratives as well. So that's important. This is just a recap. We saw this last week. To have at the back of your mind as you go to collect data uh, that peer requires certain level of freedom of expression, that uh, respondents need to feel safe to say what they think, even in contradiction to dominant viewpoints. That's a selection of participants is key and also Community of practice, uh, that, is, that means that the different voices have to be taken into account so that this very conflict survivors may be a source of healing to the community. So they become a community of practice, a community of people who are engaged for social change. Um, I, I, that's always important because if you're doing participatory research, uh, you're also looking at levels of change that uh, you'll be bringing into the society. This is another recap. Again, just to emphasize the co-creation of the, of the uh, uh, co-research aspect and 
professional development uh, that this brings into the community. And this last, uh, the one on top right and, uh, and bottom left are very key. At the end of your research, as I said last week, we begin with adaptive problems, meaning the distance between the problem and the solution is so big. Will we ever get to a time in South Sudan when people are not carrying arms? This project is, is meant to help people change their perception about the carrying of arms and to begin trusting state security. And everybody says, no, come on, this is impossible. You, 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 don't, know, you don't know what you're talking about in South Sudan. This is not going to happen. Um, so the, the distance between the problem and possible solution is so big. So participatory action research helps us to get into the holding environment, what we call the holding environment, uh, meaning we are, we are trying to reduce the distance between that uh, desperation that it will never happen and hopefulness that it will happen, that that change is possible. So we need to keep this at the back of our minds every time that uh, we do this research. Remember, this is a spiral process. Uh, that's what put those uh, clocking wheels. It means uh, we move from one end to the other. So number one, diagnosis. Remember, I, uh, we, using the logic model, I, I, I said that we need to understand where we're coming from, where we're going. So you need to diagnose. Uh, we need to have a learning community. That is um, a community that helps you to evaluate what is currently known, known about the topic and what has been studied. This will help you do the diagnosis so that within your logic model, you know this is specifically what we are going to look at. There are 15 factors, but we only want factor one and eight. That's it. Actions. Uh, in participatory action research, uh, for example, we, we do emphasize that research findings need to be geared towards action, but we need to be also clear how we are going to measure the kind of intervention and action that we are looking for. So that's critical. Number three, implementation. How are we going to measure it? How will we know that this, we, are, we are going to realize the change that we are looking for? If we are going to help women who've been traumatized from trafficking, we need to have certain indicators that will help us measure in research to know whether the change that is desired is being realized. That the post-traumatic experiences have been addressed, for example, and what are the indicators that these have been addressed? That the level of trust has been restored what is the indicator that the level of trust has been restored in the family? Perhaps this person was trafficked through the family, and now that person doesn't trust any member of the family. But gradually we have put the person through a process of healing um, so that that person can uh, begin to trust. So are we going to measure all this uh, to show that what we desired is being implemented? Uh, PR, as we shall see later, and that I've said earlier, takes a lot of reflective approach to research. We need to think of what we're doing literally on a daily basis. That's why I say that debriefing meeting is very important every day, uh, so that we evaluate our actions, our strategies, and the possible outcomes uh, that we would like to see at the end of that particular research. So now, methods. Um, of carrying out participatory research. There are so many methods, so, so many. Um, uh, the beauty with participatory research is that it's very fluid and the defining point is your own creativity. But the possibilities are so wide out there. So the most important aspect first is to observe the professional research standards. Those cannot be compromised, even if it is PR, which is much more flexible. Uh, issues around ethics, uh, confidentiality, anonymity, uh, research tools that are very well standardized for the data collection, uh, the participants' consent, and full revelation of what this research is about. Those basic standards of any kind of research are very important. The do no harm principle and all that. But in this particular PR process, 
community engagement um, through problem solving, that's key to be included in the method. Uh, victim perpetrator analysis through joint participatory uh, conversation, because we are dealing, especially in this particular research and armed civilian protection, uh, we are looking at situations of, of conflict. We can also use participatory videos. We can use personal journals. We can use digital storytelling. Possibilities are way out there um, in terms of the, the, the kind of things that uh, we can look at. So here, I'll just give you some possibilities of um, or some listing, and this is not even an exhausting list, of different kinds of PR research that you can think of. Collaborative change research, evaluation and design, that we are going to work with the community in evaluating certain ways of doing things. For example, if you're looking at a school curriculum, and we, we, we think through this school curriculum, whether it's really addressing issues of discipline, uh, issues of respect and cultural values. And then we are going to design a new one that bridges the, what was there before and what we want. Community-based participatory research. Uh, again, looking at the issues that the community is facing and how to uh, bring them in. Community-engaged research, uh, community science, decolonizing methodologies. Uh, these could be ways of uh, measuring people's perception on particular ideas about uh, the colonial inheritance and in terms of the way we do things. Uh, for example, if we, we, are, we are looking at our own curriculum in, in school setting, and we realize that uh, our history books still say that Livingstone discovered Mount Kilimanjaro. And nobody seems to question this for years and years, and some of us went to do, through the same system of schooling, that our Ministry of Education allowed this nonsense to continue that Livingstone discovered Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, because that's what the Western education imposed into our minds that certain fellow called David Livingstone, forgetting that the Chaga, the Taita people and the Maasai lived around there, called this mountain with their own names, whether it's Mount Kenya or Mount Kilimanjaro. And these communities have lived around here. They didn't need somebody to come from outside to, to discover it. So those decolonizing uh, methodologies are very important and you have to take it gradually to, for people to understand. The same thing with education action research, uh, which again, a range of uh, action research around education and, and school settings that we can use, uh, working with the teachers, the ministry, students, uh, as well as the, the parents. Um, the other could be participatory action research. This is famous and was very famous in the 80s and 90s. Uh, because it, it combines so many actions to the extent that many people refer to all these research methods simply as participatory action research. But actually, it was used much more in, uh, in, community, in communities looking at social change processes uh, from matters politics to matters development and how to engage uh, the community uh, towards a common change. Uh, another could be practitioner inquiry. And this is good for academicians, for people with the CSOs, uh, civil society organizations, anybody working towards change. It, it'd be good to see whether our own uh, professional approach to resolving issues actually is leading to the kind of change that we want. And uh, that pra practitioner's inquiry uh, tend to ask really very key poignant questions for change. Pragmatic action research is another one. And as you can see, all these are very closely uh, related uh, in terms of uh, co-generation of learning uh, approaches to, uh, to change that we want in the society. So those were just some quick examples of some possible uh, research methods that you can use uh, in terms of, I mean, research types that you can uh, use in participatory action research. Now let's go through step by step data collection methods now. I've said this before, whatever methods we use within the PR, they have to keep the standard uh, of, of good research. But participants are co-researchers, I repeat again, and the research is geared towards uh, social change. Ethics is key uh, because you're dealing with communities, you're dealing with high expectations, sometimes you're dealing with victims or survivors. 
So make sure one, you obtain the consent of the researchers, very key. In some situation, you may be required to get them to sign a consent form, depending on, a, on your type of research. Sometimes in some communities, people are very suspicious of any form that they're signing, they think that's a contract, or you're about to make a deal with the government uh, for them to be evicted or something like that, depending on their experience. Anonymity and confidentiality is important. Even though we are dealing with community where people know each other, um, when I, I come to data collection and interviews, uh, we are going to put in some measures that ensure that that's not compromised. Do no harm principle. I think we looked at this also last week in Rehema's presentation. Um, people who may be re traumatized or uh, people who's witnessing through interview may be used against them later on, and this can pose a threat to the community. Create a safe environment for data collection. I already talked about that. Transparency on the objectives of the study and what the outcomes will be used for. Um, strict preservation of the research data. Things may leak out and th this can be really damaging. Uh, so you make sure that people you're working with keep the research material, the written material, as confidential as possible, and there's a clear plan on how it's going to be done. Uh, the research director, this is his or her work uh, to ensure that data is kept safely. <clears throat> Confidentiality, let me just talk again about that. One, um, the, we can use the traditional method that the person we interview, we don't put the name. We may have the name on a different sheet, but when we are giving quotations and, and indicating who they are, we can use the traditional numeric or coded um, identifiers, 00441 or CL00441, that can be CL can be community leader, 00441 interviewed 14th of April, 2021. Ask for the PR team members to excuse themselves from reviewing data of people they may know. So you can imagine um, we, because of this concept of co-researchers co uh, and we are looking at the youth experiences in, um, in, in war or conflict situations. And we know that some of the youth could have done atrocities, could have looted, could have killed. And you're asking them to interview each other and one actually reveals that he was in the gun that broke into the shop of Mr. Suleiman and stole a lot of money. But because you are researching and uh, people feel safe enough to talk, this can really cause a lot of problem, especially if the person knows the person that is being interviewed. So we need to take caution uh, when you are doing that. So it's better you don't interview the person that you know. So we, we separate people who know each other. I strongly emphasize the importance of keeping confidentiality. I've already said that, and also to guard against um, uh, research findings becoming news in the community. And remember, they've never done this. Uh, confidentiality, that's up to you as a researcher. They don't care about confidentiality. Uh, you, may, you may have to really show the importance of why it is important to, be, to take this confidential. Um, even if it's a, a mundane thing as deciding on development projects, Somebody might be insisting that that water project should go to his village side of uh, uh, geographical location. And yet, because he or she has very good reasons, and the other person is opposing, even though they come from the same village, and thinks that it, this eventually gets into the village and becomes problematic, that this person is not with us, and okay. So take care. Um, methods that we can use, qualitative and uh, quantitative, uh, of course. Or or uh, mixed methods. Most cases with qualitative, we are looking at the causal link. Uh, do drugs contribute to violence in the schools? Sometimes it's difficult to establish that particular link, but people's opinions and perceptions are very critical in, in, in achieving that. Qualitative data collection, one can use, for example, interviews, focus group discussions, observations, field notes, Reflective journal, we'll look at some of those. 
uh, within qualitative data. The, the advantage of qualitative data, even though it's so, so demanding, is that you really get people's voices. And that, that, that can be um, a positive moving experience uh, when you have that. Steps in data collection. Contextual analysis. What is happening around me? Come up with a clear logic model in terms of what's happening around me. Root cause analysis. What do you think is the main problem here? We need a deep understanding of each aspect of the issue of concern. Participant evaluation. What kind of participants will I need to unpack the problem? Research tools. We begin preparing the research questions. I mean, the uh, interview questions developed from uh, research questions and objectives. Our research site class classification. Why should we go to this site and not the other site? Then, of course, training and preparation, which I already talked about last week. So, for example, if you're looking at uh, issues of drug abuse in school, who do we want to include in the conversational workshop? Teachers, obviously, students, school administration, and other researchers. Do I want to have them all together or do I want to have them separately? Sometimes maybe together, sometimes maybe separately. Especially these accusations and counter accusations. Maybe good to do it separately at that particular stage. It's important to, pre to have a pre-test session. I already have my questions. It's called validation of, of, of research tools, but within the PR process, um, we want to make it as user-friendly as possible. So we, we can say, all right, for the research team, we are going to have a, a tea party or we'll have some yamachoma and a bit of pizza. And during that particular conversation, we will look at a number of questions that we are raising and people are much more relaxed and they can talk and talk. Of course, you don't wait until they've taken six bottles of beer because you get more ideas than what you actually need for, for your research. Uh, but at least you create an ambience or an environment where people can soberly express themselves. So those informal sections, uh, sessions uh, are, are very important uh, at the beginning of the research as you are testing your tools or your research tools to see how effective they are. Um, no, not so big, uh, keep the numbers small, just have the key people to, to test your tools or to have a conversation around the tools or the questions. Uh, in that process of going through those questions, uh, you may see uh, what you've missed, what you can still improve, or what needs to be looked into. In terms of preparation for the interview, remember, even though you may have a list of six questions to ask, a PR process is iterative, meaning we go back and forth in search for meaning, and we get deeper and deeper into the issues. So um, the research actually needs to have that test question back and forth until we are much more comfortable that the questions that are being asked are actually meeting our objectives. Uh, you need to create a full, I mean, a, a positive environment for full disclosure. Keep it short. Don't have too many questions, especially if it's focus group discussion, um, because there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, and some questions may take much deeper conversation because you don't want to just brush and say, hey, is it true, is it false, is it, no, why does this happen? Who is responsible? Who are the actors? How long has this been happening? Uh, what would you propose to be possible solutions? What has been done before and why is it not, what, why, why did it succeed? Not more than 60 minutes, uh, close 45 or 60 minutes because there's a lot to talk about, otherwise, uh, you get participant fatigue. Engage diverse means of data collections. For example, of data collection, sorry. Um, note taking, use of computer, voice recorder. If you're going to use a voice recorder, always ask for permission of the respondent uh, so that the person knows that he or she is being recorded. At the same time, um, you can use, um, you can sort of flip back and forth and the, 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 the person who is coordinating can work very closely with the research participants in making sure that there's clear clarification 
on the questions that have been raised on some of the issues of concern and all that. Make sure you're in a very quiet environment that is effective for, for recording and also it ensures that there are no uh, interruptions back and forth. For the interviews, always make sure that um, before you begin the interviews, you make an appointment. Um, and, and also that those individuals are already recruited in advance. Have very clear systematic approach in which you're going to take uh, to, to, to ask the questions. And revealing what this research is about is key because the kind of questions you'll be asking are questions that raise expectations for solutions to the problems. So that has to be um, discussed and, and, and clarified. Uh, especially because the PR gets deeper and deeper into the issue, uh, the person may feel much, much freer to, uh, to, to reveal and tell you uh, the kinds of things that maybe you didn't even expect. Again, always, always we emphasize because of the nature of peer research, confidentiality, safety, and anonymity principles need to be observed. What kind of interviews or uh, uh, kinds of questions may you have? It can be structured, uh, using structured questions, uh, in which case all the researchers have the same questions and they're all standardized. For example, what is your opinion in the relationship between drug abuse and poor performance in schools? Everybody is going to ask that particular question. Um, but when it's um, un, un, unstructured, we, we may have uh, the, uh, the same questions, but we allow the person who is research, who is carrying out the interview to push a little further in terms of the kinds of answers that you're getting. And where a structured could just take a questionnaire, which is distributed and people answer uh, through, and structured one may have, part of it could be questionnaire, part of it, uh, or most of it will be uh, interview questions, which want to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the issues. So in this case, unstructured one will simply have very clear uh, outline questions to be asked. Semi-structured then uses a much more uh, flexible approach uh, in which some of it is structured, some of it is not structured. And you're even allowed if somebody says, no, uh, have you ever taken drugs? No. And then say, why? Um, or uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of ethical uh, approach have you taken to ensuring that you're not uh, drawn into, uh, into the drugs uh, abuse. So then um, you, you may push further with the provocative remarks that help the person to uh, reveal much more of what's happening. So some of the types of questions we may be asking, uh, maybe understanding the causes and reasons. That will go with the question, why? Why would you say that this and this and this? Um, exploring participants' opinion on an issue. Should this be considered? And how important is this in terms of uh, intervention or that had already been done? So you're looking for solution or the view or opinion of the respondent. Sometimes you want to look at the impact of a particular experience on people. And uh, it's you as a researcher to judge whether this person is in a position to do so. It could, the situation could be very traumatic um, and, and, and emotional. But if that space is there, then you say, what is your opinion on A, B, C, D? Uh, what, uh, what is your experience of this and that? How did this experience affect you? So you walk with the person through that particular experience and get deeper um, into it before you can talk solution. Reflective methodology. Uh, sometimes people are at home um, with taking notes or keeping a journal, and th there are those who are not at home with it. So this whole concept of reflective approach or keeping journals, um, in a sense that I, I reflect over the day and I say, today I met uh, three police officers uh, for, with whom I did an interview. I also talked to uh, two women who claimed they'd been victim of police violence. And I did talk to the children of these mamas and this and that. So I did note that actually that the first interview didn't go well because the policeman was very suspicious. And 
Those notes are very, very important uh, for this particular person doing the research, but if anybody comes across them, they can be used against you. So uh, reflective journals are really important, uh, but then they have to be kept very, very safe. Uh, anecdotal evidences also that may be there if there's an evidence of a particular thing that happened and uh, the person wants to use it and say that, for example, today when I was going to buy milk, I noticed uh, four people being harassed by the police and, you know, and two of them were badly injured. Uh, this is an indication to me that what people have been saying about police abuse uh, is actually real. Or um, I may also uh, decide to, to, to keep my, my journal as detailed as possible. So all these three uh, allow the participant to capture all these ideas. But in any case, whether you're using one or two or three, it is still important. Field notes, anecdotal evidence, or reflective writing. And field notes are just you know, every experience that you go through, you write. They all seem to reflect the same thing. The data becomes a bit more detailed. They become complementary to the data that you've already uh, put together. You can put them into a digital format because maybe you just want to record yourself. And they all provide us with a thick contextual analysis of the situation. So uh, when we take that into account, then we know that we are in the right track or we are not in the right track. Just like other research methods, the PR also uses observation and very, very much so. Observation here, you can be passive or you can be uh, active. In most cases for the passive, it's just observation. Like I've said, I was going to, to buy milk and I noticed police harassing uh, two young men uh, outside the the, the, the shop. And for me, that observation is important because remember you're even in the field, you're actively taking part in the research, whether you are taking notes or you're interviewing somebody or you're just observing. But it's important not to make conclusions very fast. Repeated observation is recommended here. Uh, if there's a certain trend you've seen in the marketplace, you need to visit the marketplace several times to be able to observe uh, that yes, it is true people are being sold rotten tomatoes. Um, you, you can't just go to the market one day and say, well, people are being sold rotten tomatoes. No, you need constant observation uh, for you to come up with that conclusion. But participatory uh, observation may also include um, an active engagement where maybe if um, uh, I, I go to the market and I, I join in, I say, okay, I'm also going to be selling cabbages here for the next three weeks to see uh, my reaction about the, the way in which the, the prices tend to fluctuate uh, within the market. Focus group discussions, very important for participatory reaction research. It's important not to have too many people in the FGDs, as we call them, uh, because if you have too many people, then it becomes a meeting and you don't want a meeting. You want a discussion. That's why it's, a, and it has to be focused on two to three or four or five questions. Six to 12 people, that's a good number, uh, uh, but you have to choose them and select them very, very carefully. If you're looking at community issues, maybe you want community leaders, you want religious leaders, you want women, you want men, and maybe some youth, depending on the issue that you're looking at. The moderator for FGD is very important. Can be the, one of the professional researchers or a person who has been well prepared from the community or from the group of participants uh, to carry out this. If the issue is a very divisive one, uh, maybe you are looking at inter-ethnic peace building, then a neutral person uh, helps with the discussion far much better than having somebody internally. Uh, and yet you're going to talk about conflict between communities and some of those communities can be may be represented there. Because this is PR research or uh, participatory research is, you may want to encourage co-facilitation so that it's not just one person who is dominating and still confidentiality is very important. 
Now, moderating an FGD is as good as having a good research. If the moderation is bad, the results are going to be terrible. If the moderation is good, then the results are highly likely to be good. So we may want to use the World Cafe model where people are allowed a particular space to have a conversation. And these are some of the steps for the uh, World Cafe model. And, and World Cafe model is just a model of conversation around issues that are important for us to look at. Uh, some, uh, with my colleague, we've been developing the concept of Baraza. Baraza as uh, many African societies have had it, is a, a place where the community gathers together to discuss important issues that are facing them. So it's, it's more or less the same concept for the uh, World Cafe. One, set the context, create hospitable environment. We've said that already, a very clear, um, explore the question, tell the people these are the questions we'll be looking at. Um, encourage everyone's contribution. Don't let the usual big mouth to dominate the conversation. Uh, you have to make sure that at least the people can uh, express themselves freely. Uh, listen together for insights. So the that's the work of the facilitator. Bring them back and forth to engage and uh, to talk about those experiences. Share collective discoveries. Uh, that maybe I realize that if you talk to young people in a manner that is not condescending, they're likely to listen to you and not join the, the gangs. And uh, that particular experience is important because it, it then draws into collective uh, discoveries. The use of theater and wrong plays is, is important. I think Rehema will be looking at that today. Uh, what I like about using theater or uh, using wrong plays is that you can get people to, to disconnect from a particular reality they are facing and focus much more on the play on the ground. So that if there's a problem behind uh, what is being represented by the role play, the focus then is much more on the actors within the role play and not um, on the persons outside the role play. I'll give you an example. A time uh, I was doing a workshop uh, looking at uh, some of the possible solutions to school violence and the kinds of conflict that existed in some of the Somaliland communities. The, 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 the lecturers, I mean, the, um, the participants that we had were teachers. These, these were refugee teachers somewhere in, uh, in a refugee camp in Yemen, very far away, um, end, of, end of 1999 or so. So when I asked the teachers to, to do a role play about the kinds of conflict they experience in school. And we categorize the conflict, uh, student, 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 teacher, teacher, administration, administration, teacher, and administration parents. So those five categories of, of, of conflict that we had, uh, different groups came up with their own plays. Now the, the group that was doing the role play teacher administration conflict um, acted the headmaster, the assistant headmaster, the teachers, and the students. But as the role play went on, the headmaster who was there, the assistant were really getting very, very angry with the presentation of the play. But when we got to explaining and interacting around the, uh, the role play, our focus, and I did emphasize that, we are going to talk about the headmaster in the role play, not the headmaster of this particular secondary school. We are talking about the headmaster in the role play. But underneath and the currents that we had, were actually finding a solution to existing problems within the school. And when I invited them to actually look at a much more objective way of helping this headmaster in the role play to address the teacher administration conflict, it was so interesting because the headmaster had, of course, exaggerated the whole problem, but it was very, very good opportunity to talk freely about the headmaster in the role play than to talk about the headmaster who was there present uh, among the participants. So that's the beauty of that. Um, as I've said, it is certain advantages, uh, self-distancing uh, from the issue and from the emotional attachment. Uh, also, the participants feel free to speak, you know, uh, about the actors in the play. They also have the freedom to agree or disagree in a way that you don't feel 
like you're taking sides to a reality that exists. No, you're taking sides with the reality in the role play. Uh, they can also freely come up with suggestions. They have the confidence to transpose now those solutions to the actual reality. So that's really the beauty um, of the use of, uh, of theater and, and role play. There's a group here in Nairobi known as Amani People's Theater. And Amani People's Theater, especially in the mid 90s and, and early 2000s, did a lot of uh, this kind of uh, approach. They were using Paulo Freire's approach of uh, um, getting learners to be part of the solution to the problem. And so you go to a village and you enact the, the situation as it is, and you get people really to interact and engage with the uh, solutions you're finding uh, on the ground. Okay, so use of workshop is another um, uh, approach. That's like I've, I've given that example of the teachers. Uh, when you use a workshop, you get everyone to do a contextual analysis, everyone to do an actor's analysis the historical trends of that particular problem. If it's a problem of proliferation of arms and civilian arming, uh, when did it start? Who are the suppliers? Um, how much does it cost? So we do that full, full analysis. How is it impacting the society? What is the conceptualization of security for, for, for the community? How is this impacting again uh, on the trends that we like to see in terms of change? Um, I, I, uh, no, I don't have that much time left. Uh, Ludovica, how many more minutes do I have? So that I don't uh, take Rehema's time. No problem, you have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so Reflective Journal, I've, I've already talked about it. Uh, it's, it's really documenting uh, daily experiences. Uh, in terms of what challenges am I facing? How do I overcome them? Um, what do I want to achieve? Uh, what are some of the stumbling blocks on the ground? How is the dynamic of the participatory team working? Um, so there are quite a number of things that we can include here uh, in the reflective journal, but I won't spend time on that. Let's talk about participatory video as one uh, approach that we can use. Now, participatory video is where we document people's stories based on their daily life experiences. And once we've documented that, we then present the various stories and we listen carefully to what is emerging from those particular stories. Why is this important? Um, it's important because when you read a quotation and when you listen, and see the emotional representation across uh, the person who is speaking, it doesn't have the same effect. The videos, videos have a very strong effect. And especially if you're going to, to use it for advocacy, uh, for social change, if you're going to uh, maybe present this to policymakers. And this approach, for example, if you just want to show how the environment has been destroyed by uh, the mineral extraction uh, by the Tiomin company, for example, in Kuali. That video can have a much more powerful effect than uh, just you doing it in, in a normal way. So how do you go about it? You have to train participants, first of all, in how to use the video. Uh, you can give them simple phones or, um, or, or actual cameras, but nowadays most phones can record up to 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how much uh, memory you have, uh, train them on video taking, um, let them keep track of the learning process, especially on how to shoot and, and order their videos. You need to build their confidence and self-expression. Uh, we need to maintain cycle of, of, film, uh, of filming action. That is, we are only going to uh, look at former child soldiers. And this is what we want to find out from them, their survival mechanisms or their level of integration into the family. So you are going to only shoot that. So that's the cycle of film in action. Don't move into too many things. Go straight into the point. Uh, policy influence. How are we going to use this particular uh, video for dialogue, horizontal dialogue that is between the community. Uh, when we call the parents and community leaders and other members of the community, to show the video on this, this is what the boys are saying about the experience as kidnapped 
um, boys in the past, if you're in Northern Uganda, for example. Uh, and the community listens and, and they realize actually we need to help these young people. Then you take it to policymakers, vertical dialogue, and you tell them the government need to have a policy, uh, a program for integration of these young people, uh, to a trauma counseling post program, and then at least income generating activity that can help them. The other is digital story, uh, storytelling. Uh, this methodology, famous again in the mid 90s, uh, developed by the Center for Digital Storytelling, but now this has spread into all kinds. And with social media, uh, the digital storytelling has become very, very common. Uh, we see it in WhatsApp every day. The kinds of protests that people can put in, you can self-record yourself and put it on TikTok and people listen. And it could be for fun, but it could also be to talk about something very serious. Right now with the conflict, Palestinian and, uh, and Israeli, people have been doing a lot of this. We've been doing a lot of digi digital storytelling uh, to rally against the, um, the atrocities being committed uh, in, uh, in Palestine. And then similarly, some of those reactions from Hamas. Uh, participants also go through a workshop that help them to develop personal narratives. And, and so this, this uh, whole uh, personal narrative through uh, documented media images, there could be photographs, there could be uh, Instagram that is uh, being shared through a much wider network, they do express people's experiences. They narrate a story. So digital storytelling is important. We can also use photo voice. Uh, photo voice is, is simply uh, using the camera, as I said earlier, but now uh, in most cases we use it in a situation where from, uh, communities are disadvantaged. You know, we have these um, non-reusable non cameras that you can buy for $20. You, know, you have to import them, unfortunately. Uh, but those cameras, you can give them to the kids in in slums in Kibera and say, I want you to go and take the best picture that will, you'll ever remember. And of course you explain to them why you want to, uh, to do that, but you, you want people to know the experience of living in Kibera, for example. So somebody will show um, a madhouse, somebody will show uh, women selling stuff on the road, another one will take pictures of matatus, another one crowded streets, another one uh, running sewer water. All these pictures put together are actually reflecting a much larger experience than the photo can tell. If I may just ask you, um, what do you see in these photos? What are these photos communicating to you? Refugee women and children, yes. Uh, uh, yes, child soldiers from Kuzanai, yeah. Uh, actually, all those photos are, uh, were taken in Rwanda after the genocide and that traumatic experience. And I deliberately chose the black and white uh, pictures uh, because they, they, they communicate certain, uh, a very strong, sad reality uh, that has been experienced in that particular country. Uh, and so when you just have those photos there, you don't, need, you don't need a very big story around them. They communicate by themselves. And that's the beauty uh, of, of photo, photo voice, that it's a voice within the picture uh, by itself. Uh, you, you can see here, there is so much thinking. This is in a refugee camp. Uh, and this, this, this probably around 95, 96, when I worked with refugees at that time, but I'm not the one who took these photos. Um, so these are adults. Uh, by now, they, they, they can tell you the horror of their own experiences uh, during that particular period. And, 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 and if you just have images of, of photos like this, you can get the community to talk and talk and talk and talk uh, about this. And in that way, you are collecting data uh, as well. So just to end, um, because I was to finish at 10 minutes too, uh, there's some limitations of participatory uh, research. One of them is hypotheses. We don't like using hypotheses in participatory research because we don't know how they, uh, we want to be free on how the data will reveal itself. When you have an hypothesis and, and you want to say that 
um, that that former child soldiers are likely to be rejected by their families when they when they go back. This may be limiting your research. So they tend not to use hypotheses. And those traditional researchers want to see an hypothesis. Uh, the research questions are fluid. Uh, we start off with, remember, uh, we ended up with in stage four or five with the research questions last week. After consultation, after talking to people, after uh, by the time you're coming to research questions, uh, you, you've already spent so much time within the research itself. And these questions may change as we realize that the reality is different. Um, the others also feel that this criteria is not very objective. So the criteria for objectivity is a little limited just because we have to work with the local researchers or participants, what we call the research participants, you end up with co-researchers but that may not be professional. And the fact that they are researching their own reality, they may not be objective as well. So that limits your, um, uh, the, the quality of your, of your research to some extent. The duration of the research, as I've said, you end up with a lot of dropouts because this research can take so long, can be three months, six months, eight months, two years. Uh, so how do we limit to make sure that we, we are not expanding ourselves uh, too much? And I think this is manageable, we can, uh, it can be done. Power relations, uh, we are saying we are all researchers and co-researchers, uh, so it's a kind of a horizontal uh, relationship. But at the same time, there's always this proportionate uh, power relation. Uh, we cannot ignore that. Uh, if you come in as a professional researcher, you're a professional researcher. You come in, and you're also coming in with money and you're flying into the place. Uh, that already um, uh, creates a certain disproportionate uh, power relation. Quality of the research and findings. Now, because of close involvement of the uh, research participants as co-researchers, sometimes the quality can be compromised because um, uh, the, the co-researchers may not be uh, so, so much trained in the field, but at least the, uh, and so the quality also of what they bring to you as their findings may need uh, checking and verification uh, before you can accept it to be so. Thank you uh, very much. I'm sorry for taking a few more minutes from what I was located. Thank you.